The Bible is one of the world's most famous and revered books. But is this book holy as many people claim? Were its writers really inspired of God? What do scholars have to say about the historicity of the events recorded in the Bible? Join me, Chaka Yumba, as I take a deep dive into this most fascinating book. This is the Unholy Bible Project. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Anthony Morris Returns channel and welcome to the very first episode of the Unholy Bible Project. Now the first thing I just want to say is that the title might be a bit misleading, uh, the Unholy Bible. This is not meant in any way to be sacrilegious and actually uh, this show is meant to be cater, to cater for uh, people from all walks of life, so people who have an interest in the Bible because uh, they have a faith, maybe they're Christian, maybe they're Jewish, uh, or some other faith that subscribes to to uh, the whole Bible or part of the Bible, as in the case of uh, people who are of a Jewish tradition who would subscribe to the Hebrew Bible. Um, but it's also a, a resource for people who, are, who just have an interest in the Bible for whatever reason, maybe for academic reasons or for just broadening their knowledge. Um, so the, the purpose of this show is not to bash the Bible in any way or to, um, to be very um, pejorative towards uh, the Bible in any way, shape or form. Uh, this is actually purely a, you could say, kind of like an academic um, look at the Bible. And the reason why I've called it the Unholy Bible Project is because I will be looking at the Bible not as a holy or a religious book, I would be looking at it as a work of literature and I will be treating it as I would treat any other type of literature. So for example, if somebody was reading Shakespeare, so I'll be reading the Bible as if I was reading a piece of work like Shakespeare. And this is the reason why, this is the reason why I've called it uh, the Unholy Bible Project. And you notice I also call it a project because this is probably going to be a very long project that might span several years. So my idea with this project is that I'm going to go through the Bible kind of forensically from the beginning, from Genesis chapter 1 and hopefully to the end of Revelation chapter 22. And what I'm going to be doing essentially is I will be reading the Bible through the lens of what scholars have had to say about the Bible. Now, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not claiming to be a Bible scholar. I don't even intend to be a Bible scholar at any uh, point. I'm just somebody who has an interest in the Bible just because of uh, my, my religious upbringing. And I no longer believe in the Bible as um, the inerrant word of God as an inspired book. I just look at it as a piece of literature, but I think that it is still a very fascinating book. And I think that it is a very sophisticated book, um, uh, which you can spend, people actually spend their entire lifetime just studying maybe just a part of the Bible. So you've, you've got uh, New Testament scholars, you've got Hebrew Bible scholars and so on. And some people just dedicate their lives studying a section of it. Um, the reason why I have decided to come up with this series was when I started digging deeper into the Bible and started sort of questioning things that I just accepted initially as things that are that were inspired by God, that were in the Bible for some reason, um, I found a lot of very useful resources. I found a lot of uh, free resources. One of the resources that was very, very helpful for me was the open year courses. So when you go on um, OYC, dot yell dot edu i've got to put that in the description they have two fascinating courses so they have an introduction to the hebrew bible by uh, christine hayes and then they've got an introduction to the new testament by del martin and i found these resources very 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 helpful and they opened my mind to a lot of things they opened my eyes to a lot of things that i had previously not seen in the bible when i read it um and, and, and so that was really, really good. And, and then there's a few other resources that I looked at. But one difficulty that I encountered, and I would be interested in the comments if anyone has found a resolution to this, was that, um, yes, there are a lot of resources, but if you just wanted something that went through, something that was easily accessible, that went through the Bible schools, just like chapter by chapter, uh, or let's say story by story even, 
Uh, it's very difficult to find such a resource. And this is what made me come up with this idea of this Unholy Bible project, where I'm just going to try and put all my findings in, in one place. Now, this is going to be a long-term project, as I've said, uh, which might span several years, and we'll see where we are. So I'm going to be presenting this in the form of uh, uh, these videos. Um, I will also try and set it up so that it's also available in the form of a podcast so that people who don't have that ability to sit down and watch a video, they can just listen to that podcast while they're driving or they're doing some other activities. But the idea is I will try to sort of bring what scholars have to say about every, pretty much every part of the Bible through this project. And also the idea is that if, if this project gains a lot of traction in that there's a lot of interest from uh, people, um, then I will think about writing my findings in a book. So it's not actually going to be a, a one book, it's going to be a volume of books. Uh, because what I'm thinking for the first part of this Unholy Bible project is that uh, the book of Genesis itself will compose of volume one. So I'm hoping to sort of do one episode every week and then that means that hopefully by the end of this year 2024 i would have done the whole of genesis and that will be volume one of the unholy bible project so that's probably what the book is going to look like where a section of the bible is covered in one volume uh, of, of this book if, if i eventually end up in a situation where i can actually write a book so uh, this is um the idea so this is kind of like a neutral place it's a place for um all people who hold faith so people who lack faith because um, if you've seen any of the other stuff that I produce on this channel, it's pre pretty much dedicated to people who have some kind of contact with my former religion. But that's not what I'm going to be doing in, in this. This is kind of a neutral space for, for everyone. Um, so I think that, uh, that that's... Um, those are the most important things I needed to mention in terms of an introduction. That's quite a long introduction, uh, but I'll put chapters in here so that people can just skip to the point if, if that's what they want to do. So I'm just going to uh, bring up the slides. Um, so uh, that's the title of the whole project, the series. It's called The Unholy Bible Project. I've explained uh, why I've called it that. Um, and this is volume one, episode one. And the title is Did Moses write the Pentateuch. Now, uh, there's just one thing that I also just need to mention uh, before we get into the, this discussion in earnest, is that I'm going to be reading the scriptures. When I reference scriptures, I'll mostly be reading them. I will put the scriptures in the slides, the scriptures that I intend to, to read and reference. I will put them in the slides. Um, just to make it easier so that I'm just not going back and forth looking for the scriptures. Um, and I'm going to be using also a neutral translation of the Bible. I'm going to be using the new revised standard version updated edition. So it's also referred to as NRSV UE. Um, and this is kind of a widely respected scholarly uh, produced uh, translation of the Bible. Um, as with a, a, any translation, there are a lot of difficulties and there are lots of reasons why, even with the best interest, scholars cannot produce the perfect Bible. Um, now, one of the difficulties that the NRSV UE has is that it uses, um, it uses the word Lord in all capitals, where they, in the original text, in the original Hebrew, there was the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. And I'm, I'm just gonna demonstrate that very quickly. I'm just gonna go uh, a few slides in. So if you go look on slide number three, um, there is the, the scripture there in Exodus 34 verse one. And if you're reading the New Revised Standard Edition, the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition, what you will see here at the beginning is it says the Lord and Lord is in all capitals. And if you read the preface, it, it explains that in the original, you'd have had those four letters. Now, this becomes quite difficult when you're explaining some of the theories uh, or, or some of the findings that researchers has, have found if you don't know that actually there was the term grammaton in that place. And so I have just taken the liberty of replacing that L O R D capitals with what was originally in the text, the Y H W H, and a lot of um, the people who discuss these topics, uh, especially scholars, lecturers, when they do lectures, they do that effectively. So I don't, I'm, I'm being honest and upfront about it. 
um, and it's it's purely for scholarly and academic purposes that I am making that change. So uh, I hope that is uh, helpful to people. Um, so so the, 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 what I'm going to be covering in this particular episode is the question of whether Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And by the Pentateuch, I mean the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, those, sorry, Numbers and Deuteronomy that makes up the Pentateuch. Um, and I will be examining the question whether Moses actually wrote that, that which is a, a kind of common view among uh, religious people, Christians, uh, I'm not entirely sure whether in the Jewish community that's still a common view. So I'll be examining that question in depth. Um, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of what I will be covering in volume one. So as I mentioned in volume one, I will be covering um, pretty much most of the book of Genesis. So I, I'm not going to be doing it verse by verse, but I'll be kind of be doing, doing it story by story. So I'll be looking at the main stories in the book of Genesis and looking at uh, what scholars have discovered about these stories. Uh, I'm not a scholar, as I've said, but I'm a human being. I have emotions and I have opinions. And so sometimes I will mention my opinion regarding uh, what I think was happening in that story. Uh, but I will be doing this on the backbone of, of what scholars have to say. And I'll also be trying to sort of um, go with the consensus, the general consensus among scholars I'll be trying my best to do that, but if I get it wrong, um, please bear with me because I'm not a Bible scholar and I'm not claiming to be one. So yeah, so in volume one, uh, in this episode, I'll be covering the authorship of the Pentateuch. In the next episode, I will cover um, Genesis chapter one and part of Genesis chapter two. And actually there are two different creation stories in the book of Genesis. So I'll be discussing why scholars have uncovered that there are actually two different creation stories in the book of Genesis and what those stories are and what's distinct about the two different stories. Uh, then I will, I think there are a couple of stories in between there, but the major story that I'll be covering is the, the flood account. There are also two distinct flood accounts in the book of Genesis. And I will be going through that in volume one. Um, I'll talk about the story of the Tower of Babel and then a huge portion of the volume one, we'll be discussing the patriarchs. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and a few of the other characters obviously will be covered. But there's so many stories with regards to the patriarchs that I think maybe to take a couple of dozen episodes to cover all those stories. So I'll, I'll try and go through those in, in a lot of detail. And I've also just highlighted um, Jacob's deathbed prophecy which is found in Jacob in Genesis chapter 49. And I think this is an important um, thing to consider as a sort of as a standalone item, just because in the deathbed prophecy, you have um, Jacob effectively on his deathbed prophesying that uh, from the tribe of Judah, there will, be, there will be the kingly line. But then the first king of Israel is not from the tribe of Judah. It's so he's from Benjamin and then he has to be replaced. So that creates a lot of problems. And um, scholars have uh, looked at certain things when you look at the Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible as a whole, and then covered things that help us understand that deathbed prophecy. So I'll be going through that. Um, so yeah, so I'll pretty much be trying to cover uh, most, if not all, of Genesis, but not verse by verse, story by story. Um, so let's maybe get into this question of the um, authorship of the Pentateuch. So did Moses actually write the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? And if he did not write, then who actually wrote, wrote uh, the, these books? And why does this question even arise? Um, well, if you're just reading the Bible uh, as a person of faith, it's kind of like one of those things that you just take for granted. You just accept that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. What's the problem there? Um, and, and I think you can find a lot of reasons to support that, that argument. So uh, I guess maybe one of the most obvious reasons is the fact that we know that Moses, at the very least, he collected the Ten, Ten Commandments, which is a very famous part of the Bible. So he goes up the mountain, uh, God gives him these tablets with the Ten Commandments wrote on them, and then he breaks the Ten Commandments, um, he goes up, he goes back up the mountain, and now you have Exodus 34, verse 1, where uh, YHWH, Yahweh, said to Moses, 
cut two tablets of stone like like the former ones and i will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you broke so moses they're very much being involved in the writing at least of the um ten commandments and actually if you look on the slide below there there are other verses which you can have a look at and I'm not going to go into those uh, verses in detail, but those verses talk about Moses writing, Moses being instructed to write a particular aspect of, of, the, of the law that God was giving to the Israelites, with Moses being instructed to write um, a document. So there are references in the actual Pentateuch of Moses writing at least portions of uh, what has now become part of the Pentateuch. So I guess that's a, an argument that people can use to support the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Um, there are also some extra Pentateuch sources that point to the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. And by extra Pentateuch, I just mean sources outside of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, sources within the Bible that suggest or actually even state that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And um, this is not an exhaustive list, but I've just given you a couple of examples here. So in Ezra 7 verse 6, uh, the first part of Ezra 7 verse 6, it says, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that uh, YHWH, God of Israel, had uh, so I think I was trying to fix the the Lord, <laughs> and I haven't really done it properly, so I have to correct these slides before I upload them. And the other thing I just need to, uh, I didn't mention at the beginning, is for, for each of these episodes, I will be putting a link to the slides uh, on the description of the video uh, so that people can have access to these slides. So uh, what it said there was effectively the Lord, the God of Israel, but it's actually... Yahweh, the God of Israel, had given them. So Moses there being, uh, 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 Israel is making the attribution to Moses of having written the, the law, I think, and there by the law, he's probably referring to the first, uh, at, at least a good portion of the first five books of, of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Uh, so we, that's Ezra. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew 8 verse 4, it says, then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So Jesus is making a reference to a law in the, um, in the Pentateuch that talked about someone who had leprosy. If they were cured from the leprosy, they, they could go and um, show themselves to the priest. The priest would examine them and declare them clean because someone who had well, leprosy was viewed as unclean. So. Jesus is making that reference to the Pentateuch and he's referencing Moses as the author or as the originator of those laws. Um, and then uh, the Apostle Paul as well makes a similar attribution. First Corinthians 9 verse 9, he says, uh, it's, he writes, Paul writes, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? So the law of Moses, again, an attribution of at least a significant part of the Pentateuch originating from Moses. Uh, so these are extra Pentateuch sources within the Bible, kind of supporting that argument of the mosaic authorship of um, um, the Pentateuch. Um, there are also some extra biblical sources. So now we're moving outside of the Bible itself and just moving to some external literature that support this idea of the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. So one of these is Philo of Alexandria. Uh, in the works of Philo, he wrote, Moses says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, this is a very clear attribution to the book of Genesis, the, uh, the book of Genesis, the very first part of the Pentateuch, as being written by Moses. And he makes it, he's stating that quite explicitly. Um, uh, Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, quite a famous first century Jewish historian, uh, he writes in Flavius Josephus against Appian that uh, he basically asserts that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch in that view. And, and that view remained quite standard for, you know, pretty much millennia. 
um, in, in Jewish thought and among Jewish rabbis that Moses was the undisputed author of the Pentateuch. But, except uh, there were problems that even rabbis themselves were grappling with, with this idea of Moses being the author of the, the Pentateuch. Um, and one of the problems, um, well, they are problems which you and I can just identify by without having without being a scholar without looking into this history that I am discussing here um, one of the problems is we we saw what Philo or what uh, Alexandria there said uh, in the Moses wrote in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and it's not just that Moses then gives this detailed descri description of the creation account of how God effectively created um, the heavens how he created the earth how he started creating um, uh, uh, seas, land, uh, animals, plants here on the earth, and eventually humans. Now, the question is, how did Moses find out things that happened before any human even existed here on the, plan on, on the planet Earth, if he was the author of um, the Pentateuch, including Genesis? So uh, th that's a question that I personally had, even when I was a believing uh, Christian. Um, I, I found that a bit confusing, and I didn't really have a good answer or good explanation given to me. Um, in, in the book of Genesis particularly, uh, Moses also writes very intricate details of, about the patriarchs, um, about Abraham, about Isaac, about uh, Jacob, about Joseph. He, he even writes about intimate conversations. So for example, he writes about conversations that Abraham was having with Sarah in, in their home. He writes about other conversations that they were having with people around them where it was just two people involved in those conversations. And you find these long dialogues or monologues in the book of um, Genesis. And you just wonder how did he record all that information? How did he record it in such a detailed way? Where did he get the information for such um, long and detailed conversations, intimate conversations? Um, that, so that, for me personally, that was a problem, and that I guess it could be a problem for a lot of people that are reading the Bible. You have to have some kind of good explanation for that, uh, unless you're just going to go, well, more God taught him. That's what happened. Um, I, I guess it's very difficult to find a satisfactory explanation. Uh, the other question that comes up is, why does Moses never write in the first person? Uh, it's understandable if, if you just take the book of Genesis that, okay, there's, there's nothing there to do with Moses in the book of Genesis. He doesn't exist at that point. But in the book of Exodus, um, going from Exodus to uh, Deuteronomy, Moses is very, very involved in pretty much all the action that's happening in those in those books. But he never writes in the first person. He never says, then I did this, then I went there, then I was asked to do this. He, he always talks about himself in the third person. He always says, and then Moses was told to do this, and then Moses went and did this, and this is how Moses reacted. Um, the other question uh, that I, I also had this question, even when I was a kid, even when I was a kid and reading the Bible, I had this question of how did Moses write about his own death? So if we're saying he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, how did he write about his own death? How did he know when he was about to die, when he died, when how he was buried, how people mourned his death and so on? Because he writes, all those things are described quite in quite some detail in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. So these are kind of obvious problems that I think anyone who's just switches on their brain while reading these things will, will kind of encounter. Um, so what actually happened? We said that the rabbis uh, pretty much accepted that Moses was the author of the Bible, but even then there was, there was a kind of a, a debate. So there's this passage I've just referenced, uh, Deuteronomy 34 verses 5 to 12, which talks about the, the actual death of Moses um, and, and, and what happened beyond that. And they actually said, well, some of them said, well, Moses had a revelation that he was going to die and this was going to happen. And then so he wrote that. And others said, well, actually, uh, uh, verses 5 to 12 is an appendix to the Pentateuch. So this was written by a companion of Moses. Perhaps Joshua wrote this appendix and then added it to the book of Deuteronomy. So even people who just generally accepted that Moses was the author still found a lot of difficulty 
with, uh, or at least some difficulty with some aspects of the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Uh, then in the 12th century, there came a, a Spanish philosopher uh, called Abraham Ibn Ezra. Now, uh, I know in the slide I've said that he raised some issues with the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Now, I guess this was kind of some kind of internal or even, well, external dialogue maybe with himself and trying to get others involved in the dialogue because Ab Abraham Ibn Ezra insisted right up to, as far as I know, right up to his very death that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch. And now what he did was he, he had uncovered some kind of difficulties, you could say, uh, with this theory um, when, when in his own reading of the Pentateuch. And what he did is he started kind of raising this in kind of an um, um, indirect way. Uh, so he was sort of like using readers to kind of raise these questions. And the, I've highlighted some of the verses that he discovered that actually were quite difficult if you were to accept that Moses wrote the whole uh, Pentateuch. So one of them was Deuteronomy 1 verse 1. And there it says, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness on the plain opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dai Zahab. Um, and the problem with this verse is that Moses is seen as speaking um, on the other side of the Jordan, not the side of the Jordan where the Israelites where when they settled in the promised land because if you remember the israelites had to cross the jordan river to go and settle in the promised land now whoever the author is of the book of deuteronomy he is he seems to be on the other side of the the jordan river um where the israelites have settled and he's writing from his perspective and saying well before we cross the jordan uh, before the Israelites, the nation crossed the Jordan, Moses spoke these words. So that's what he's saying here, beyond the Jordan. So th this actually raises the question. So if, if Moses never crossed the Jordan, as we are told in the Bible very, very explicitly, how is he then writing from the perspective of somebody who has crossed the Jordan and into the promised land uh, or into the, the side where the promised land is? So that's one of the issues uh, Abraham bin Ezra noticed. Um, he noticed a few other issues. So in Genesis, so he, he noticed what um, I will call anachronisms. Um, now, for those people who are not familiar with what an anachronism is, an anachronism is when um, an idea from a later time is imposed onto an event that is supposed to, supposed to have happened in an earlier time. And you find a lot of anachronisms in the Bible and actually during this uh, series we're going to be talking about these anachronisms and identifying them um, uh, and just to kind of illustrate what is meant by anachronism an anachronism is imagine if you were reading a let's say a novel or a I don't know a spy thriller or anything like that that was set in the 70s or the 80s I don't know 60s 70s 80s whatever and imagine that in that story, they started talking about a smartphone. So this is set in the 60s, 70s or 80s, and they're talking about a smartphone. That would be an anachronism because smartphones did not exist. There wasn't even the idea of smartphones in, in that era. And this happens quite a lot in the Bible. And this anachronism is noticed was noticed by Abraham bin Ezra in Genesis 12, verse 6, where it says, um, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moray. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So that's an important thing to notice because um, whoever this author is, he's clearly talking about a time when the Canaanites no longer live in the land in which the story is being written. Because why would he say at that time the Canaanites were in the land if um, the Canaanites are no longer in the land because the Israelites have pushed the Canaanites out of the land. So, so this seems to be a later story from a time when the Israelites are settled in, uh, in the promised land. The next one is Genesis 2, 22 verse 14. It says, so Abraham 
code the place. Uh, I should have actually corrected this and I'll correct it before I upload the slides. It says the place uh, they it will say Yahweh will provide as it is said to this day on this mount of the law uh, on this mount of Yahweh it shall be provided. Um, so here this scripture is making a reference to Mount Moriah. Now what we know now is Mount Moriah was located in Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem, uh, so the Mount Moriah, that was the Temple Mount, that's where the, the, the temple was eventually constructed in Jerusalem. Now the story here is saying that, th that during this time in which the writer is writing, when people go to Mount Moriah to offer the sacrifices, they say on the Mount, um, on the Mount of the Lord, on the Mount of Yahweh, it shall be provided when they go to offer sacrifices. So this is clearly talking about a time when uh, Jerusalem is an Israelite city. Um, there is some worship going on there at, uh, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem and on this mountain, Mount Moriah. There's probably a temple at Mount Moriah. This is when this story is likely being written. So how could Moses have known years in advance that um, there, there would be the occupation of Jerusalem, that Jerusalem would be, uh, the, the Temple Mount will, would be used for worship, the, the temple will be constructed there. So this author is definitely writing from that perspective of a temple, more very likely existing on Mount Moriah. So how could it be Moses if that is the situation? Because he says it to this day, to this day, from the author's perspective, that situation already exists, a situation which never existed in Moses's time. So, so I'm just going to go over that again, because uh, sometimes when you're watching lectures by scholars, they go over this very quickly, and I, I want this to be as accessible as possible for people. So basically, the writer of Genesis 22 verse 14 lives at a time when the Israelites have occupied Jerusalem. Uh, the Israelites use Mount Moriah for some form of worship, very likely the temple already exists at Mount Moriah and sacrifices are offered there. And that's why this uh, author says, as it is said to this day, the time the author is writing, on the Mount of the Lord, on the Mount of Yahweh, it shall be provided. Um, so it is very difficult to say that that was Moses. In fact, I think it's impossible to say that that was Moses writing because during Moses' lifetime, uh, the Israelites never occupied Jerusalem. They never had any worship on Mount Moriah. So the next one that Ibn Ezra identified, the next tricky verse that he identified is Deuteronomy 3 verse 11. Um, it says there, now only King Og of Bashan was left of the remnant of Rephaim. In fact, his bed, an iron bed, can still be seen in Rabbah of the Ammonites. By the common cubit, it is nine cubits long and four cubits wide. Now, I've added all, all the italics you see in the scriptures are mine. Um, so this author, again, is writing from their perspective um, where they're saying this thing can still be seen, this bed can still be seen. Now, this battle that is spoken about here was waged in the 40th year of the trek of the Israelites. Now, we also know that Moses did not survive the, the whole 40 years or beyond the 40-year trek of the Israelites in the wilderness because he was told he was not going to enter the promised land and he died. Now, this author is saying at the point that he's writing, this bed has now uh, moved to the city of Rabbah in Ammon. Now, there is a very interesting comparison that you can make with Deuteronomy 2 verse 37. So in, in Moses's lifetime, Moses is saying that the Israelites were forbidden from going into the land of Ammon. Now, if Moses was the author of this verse, you have to think about the fact that um, sufficient time had passed from the time that this war happened to the time that this bed ended up into an Ammonite city, the city of Rabbah, and uh, also sufficient time had passed such that 
the Israelites were either ignoring this command or not really applying this command to enter this city of Rabbah, uh, of the Ammonites. So, so how could Moses be the author of this? Because the fact that the author actually says can still be seen seems to suggest that quite a good amount of time has, 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 has passed since uh, this, this battle took place. Uh, so again, this really raises the question as to whether, uh, our, at least I think you can very safely say that with these verses that we've looked at, that Ibn Ezra um, identified, Moses clearly could not have been the author of those verses. So let's just go over them um, very quickly. So we've got uh, Deuteronomy 1 verse 1, the idea of the author being beyond the Jordan, or on the side of the Jordan, where the Israelites ended up occupying. And Moses, we know, never crossed the Jordan, so he couldn't have written this verse. Um, the author writing about a time when the Canaanites were in the land, we know that Moses never experienced the, the elimination of the Canaanites from the promised land. So again, couldn't have been Moses. Um, and then this Genesis 22 verse 14 is a reference to the um, Temple Mount being used for worship in Jerusalem and something Moses never experienced in his life, lifetime. And then there's this reference of the iron bed that ended up in, a, in an Ammonite city still being in existence, uh, uh, very likely quite a significant amount of time after that battle for it to be kind of a surprise or kind of an interesting fact that actually that bed is still there. You know, uh, it means that some sufficient time had passed and this idea of the Israelites not being allowed to enter Ammon not being such a big issue. So these are the things that Ibn Ezra identified. Now, he, he was writing in a way a, where he was just saying, well, the, you know, think about this. He wasn't really categorically saying Moses was not the author of the, uh, the Pentateuch. He was writing in a kind of roundabout way, so to speak, because obviously at that time it was probably quite an issue to just just stand up and start questioning um, the something so widely accepted as the uh, mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. Uh, now, there's just one more verse. Now, this this is an extra verse. I I I, I don't think Ibn Ezra um, identified this one. I'm not I'm very sure, but this is another verse where they, we have an, an anachronism. So I've, I've gone over what an anachronism is. I'm not going to repeat that, uh, but it says, Genesis 36 verse 31 says, these are the kings who reigned, uh, just, sorry, apologies for that. Uh, it says, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. So now again, if we're saying that Moses wrote Genesis, how come he's talking about a time? He's talking from a point of view of a time when they're kings in Israel, because you, you only say before, any kings re reigned over Israel, meaning that you, you have now experienced a time, you're you either experiencing a time when the kings are ruling over Israel or you're experiencing a time beyond the time when the kings ruled over Israel. Um, but this author clearly has experienced this. Moses never experienced any of that. He never experienced a king ruling over Israel. He never experienced a time when he could say, oh, in the past, we, the Israelites used, used to have a king. He never experienced that, so, but this author has experienced that, and that clearly cannot be Moses. So what happened next? So there came um, a man called Benedict de Spinoza in the 17th century. Uh, also, he's called, also called Baruch, Baruch Spinoza, B-A-R-U-C-H. Uh, I will add that to the slide. Um, so he uncovered more problems with the theory of the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. And he was quite radical in his views and he was very categorical about it. So for example, he said that the idea that Moses wrote the Pentateuch was ungrounded and even irrational. And he pointed to a, a, a number of additional verses in addition to the ones that uh, Ibn Ezra had identified. For example, Numbers 12 verse three, it says, and now the man Moses was very humble, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Um, now, a lot of translations, including the translation I grew up with in the religion I grew up with, said that Moses was by far the meekest of all the, the men on the earth. Um, so that's maybe a rendering that you'd be more familiar with. 
happen. Now, the question that, that arises is, and I actually also used to have this question before I sort of delved into Bible scholarship, um, how is Moses basically claiming to be humble and at the same time saying he's by far more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth? So either Moses has a very um, high self-esteem or or more likely it's not Moses that is writing this, it's somebody else that is characterizing Moses from a third person point of view. Um, another verse that he identified is Deuteronomy 34 verse 10, which says, never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Um, now this is a comparison. Moses is being compared to all the other prophets now, you might, you just wonder, in what period is this? Is this is this in the period of uh, the judges? Is this in the period of, of the when the prophets were very active during the times of the kings, when this comparison is being made? Or is it maybe some at some point towards the end of the writing of the, of the Hebrew Bible? Um, so clearly, there has to have been a period when there has been extensive activity uh, of prophets for, for this comparison to be made, for this comparison to make any sense. If you were just gonna take the lifetime of Moses, Moses was effectively uh, the only, or at least the main prophet during his entire lifetime. So this is not an effective comparison. So for the comparison to work, there has to have been a period of significant activity of many great prophets. Um, uh, and that's when the comparison is being made. So this clearly could not have been written by Moses either. Um, and then you've got, um, Genesis 14 verse 14, it says, when Abraham heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Um, now the city of Dan did not exist during the time of uh, Moses. Why? Because the Israelites were in the wilderness. Uh, the this territory of Dan was only given to um, the, uh, uh, the the this tribe uh, during I think it was in the latter part of Joshua's time um, or yeah or going going into the period of the judges it didn't exist in Moses's time so again another another example of an anachronism if you were to take uh, Moses as the author so uh, what conclusions did uh, Spinoza come come to once he found all those issues. So Spinoza states, it is clearer, so it is on my words, but his words are clearer than the sun at noonday, that the Pentateuch was not written by Moses, but some, but by someone who lived long after Moses. And Spinoza went on to conclude that Moses only wrote limited portions of the Pentateuch. He suspected that Ezra was probably the author or compile of the full history that we find in the Pentateuch. And these were kind of radical views in the 17th century when there was still this reverence to the idea of uh, Moses being the author of the Pentateuch. So what eventually happened to Spinoza was he was eventually excommunicated uh, from the Catholic Church for, for being so vocal and having such radical views. But this was really kind of the beginning of this um, a critical reading of, of, the, of the Pentateuch. Um, then we have another scholar who was also, who played quite a very, very significant role. So his name was Jean Astruc. So those of you that speak French, maybe please help me with my pronunciation. Um, and he, he wasn't like his day job was not being a Bible scholar, but he was somebody who was clearly interested in, in, in Bible and the critical reading of the Bible. And again, just to clarify again another terminology. So when you talk about critical or criticism, it's not bashing the Bible. We're talking about just reading it carefully, uh, identifying problems and trying to resolve those problems and trying to come up with an interpretation that makes a, a sense, sense for, predominantly from a historical point of view. So uh, when you read the Bible quite carefully, particularly particularly, I think this is more clear in Genesis, you will notice that in some stories, um, God is just called God. And the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. So if you're reading it in Hebrew, you'll find that in some, some of the stories, um, you, you have God being called Elohim. 
The other thing you will find is that in other stories, God is called Yahweh. And a clear example is, of this is uh, in, in Genesis chapter 4, it states that, um, that, that people started calling on the name Yahweh in Genesis chapter 4. But then if you go into Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3, God in, introduces himself for the first time to Moses as Yahweh. And he says, I have not been known by this name and, until now. Um, and then in Genesis, in Exodus chapter six, he introduces himself again um, as, as as Yahweh. So this is something that was noticed by uh, Astro. And the other thing that you will notice also in the uh, when you read the the Genesis um, and the whole Pentateuch, but Genesis in particular, you will notice that some stories repeat themselves. So we have what we call doublets where one story, the uh, same story is, is told twice and, and sometimes some of the minor details are changed, but you can tell that it is clearly the same story. Um, you also have what are called triplets where the story is actually effectively repeated twice. Now, for purely, some scholars argue that if for, for, for a story to be called a, a, a doublet or a triplet it has to have like elements of the same characteristic uh, elements of the same like uh, key elements that are the same so it has to involve the same characters it has to be generally talking about the same thing maybe there might be a change in in location and something like that but but generally same characters same thing same same resolution to the story uh, i kind of take a more uh, nuanced view of what a, a, what a doublet or a triplet is. So an example that I'm going to give you just um, uh, is for you to understand what I was building up towards was there is something which I, I consider to be a triplet in the book of Genesis. So in the book of Genesis, you have a, the story of Abraham lying about Sarah being his wife, and he does this on two separate occasions but he effectively he's doing the same thing and the outcome is effectively the same because he doesn't want Sarah to be taken by another uh, man. But then you also have Isaac doing the same thing with Rebecca. So some scholars say, well, that's not a triplet. It is a doublet in the case of Abraham and Sarah, but you can't say with Isaac, although it's unlikely that the same thing, the exact same thing happened with Isaac, but you can't really call that a triplet. But I think that's a triplet. I think it's the same story being told three times. And this is one of the things that you notice. And this is what made um, Astrak to start thinking that maybe Moses was using uh, different sources. Uh, so Astrak believed, he was a firm believer in the fact that Moses was, well, in the idea that Moses had written uh, the Pentateuch. But what he was saying was, well, I think Moses was using different sources. And what uh, what Astrup was saying was, was that Moses actually took all these sources and he tried to be as faithful as he could be to those sources and he put them in these columns. Uh, so Astrup was saying that those stories that use the name God, that call God, God, Elohim in, in Hebrew, he, he, he referred to those as the A stories. And then there were the stories that uh, use the divine name Yahweh, he called those the B stories. So, so that you have Moses putting these stories in these two columns, the A stories and the B stories. And then he said, well, there was a few other fragments that Moses used. And he said there was probably up to 10 fragments. And he says, uh, well, the, the, the key, the main fragments among those was the C and the D, but the, main, the, the biggest sources are A and B. And then you've got these other fragments, chief among them are C and D. So this was kind of a good theory. Um, and this was improved upon by um, let's just move on to the next slide, by another the, the, a German scholar now. The German scholars now enter into this field. And uh, so the a German scholar by the name of Johann Gottfried Eichhorn. Uh, so what Eichhorn did was that he, 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 he ran with that theory, the A-B uh, source theory that, um, that Astrock had developed. And here now we're beginning to have what we call source criticism. And again, it's not criticizing who the sources were, but it's just really reading carefully and trying to figure out what sources did the author or the compiler of this work use. So what he did was he, he kind of renamed, he developed this naming convention. So he looked at those stories that were calling um, God Yahweh 
and he called them the J sources. So the, the reason why it's J, Yahweh obviously starts with a Y, but the reason why it's J is that in, in German, the spelling for Yahweh, it starts with a J, so it's Jahwe. It, it, you'd pronounce it in English as Jahwe, but I think in German they probably say Yahweh. Uh, and so it's the, he called that the J source. And then the source that uses El, that used Elohim, he called that the E source, so that you have these two sources, J and E, instead of this um, more... Uh, arbitrary um, A B kind of naming convention. So, so, so this was quite a good theory. And also on top of that, um, whereas Astrak used applied his theory only to uh, the whole of Genesis and uh, the first two chapters of Exodus, uh, Icon applied this theory to the rest of the Pentateuch, the entirety of the Pentateuch, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. He said they are these two sources that are being used uh, in throughout the Pentateuch, the J source and the E source, and they're being combined. And that's why you have doublets and in some cases, triplets of stories. Uh, and it was quite a satisfactory story. And actually, when I first heard about this theory and I started looking carefully, I thought that was quite, that's quite a satisfactory explanation of things. But the story doesn't end there. Um, there came another German author. Um, his name was W. M. L. De Vetter. Well, he, if you, you're interested what they, in what the initials W. L. M. L. stand for, they stand for Wilhelm Martin Lebrecht, but is generally referred to as W. M. L. De Vetter. Now, W. M. L. De Vetter noticed that there was something unique about the book of Deuteronomy. So he noticed that in, in the book of Deuteronomy, there's kind of a fresh start. So, you know, in the um, in the earlier books, uh, sort of Exodus, Leviticus, uh, uh, Moses really mediates the law between God and the nation of Israel, particularly in the book of Exodus. But the Veta noticed that this happens again in Deuteronomy, where towards the end of his life, Moses is then mediating the law again and basically making this the Israelites get into this covenant once again with God. Um, and the other thing that he noticed was that uh, towards the end of Numbers, the story of Moses really ends. So uh, Moses is told he's going to die. Moses appoints Joshua and so on. And this story effectively ends there. But the better noticed that in, in, in Deuteronomy, the story starts afresh. Um, and a lot of the stuff that is in Leviticus and in Numbers is, is then being repeated in Deuteronomy. Um, and the, the other thing that he noticed was that the style of writing of Deuteronomy was, was significantly different from what is in the earlier books of the Pentateuch. Uh, and even the theological viewpoint was different. So, for example, in Deuteronomy, you have this strong insistence of a single sanctuary for worship. You have this polemic against multiple places of worship scattered throughout the land uh, where that the Israelites occupy. So this was quite new. So De Veta um, then came up with a theory that actually Deuteronomy is a separate source in itself. So it's not a J or an E source, or, it's also, or a combination of those sources, but it has to be a separate source on, on its own. And then he cross-referenced this to the story, this story we have in the in in the book of Kings, Second Kings twenty two and twenty three, where Josiah uh, starts these reforms in the temple, and then the priests find the, the book of the law, and then Josiah find Josiah discovers that actually we're not following the law, and then he starts instituting these reforms. He starts uh, tearing down down these places of worship that are scattered throughout the land, and insisting on on a single place of worship. So they better concluded that the earliest sources must have been written during the time of Josiah, during the time of Josiah's reign, that's towards the end of the monarchic period, and the book of Deuteronomy itself being a separate source. So, and this source was then referred to as the D source, D for Deuteronomy, as a source separate on its own. Um, so, so at this stage now we have three sources effectively. So we have the J source that uses Yahweh, um, for when it call, refers to God, you have the E source that uses Elohim when it refers to God, and then you have a separate source, a standalone source, Deuteronomy, the D source. Uh, so the, later on, another um, scholar, Carl 
David Ilgen, he, he suggested that actually there is a, a third source. So the stories that use Elohim, it is not just one source, there's two sources. And again, this would be, become apparent when you read the uh, when you read the Pentateuch quite carefully, uh, starting from Genesis. So, for example, in Genesis, you have the first story being, you, if you just went by the J and the E uh, source theory, you would have that source being assigned to E. But the thing is, that source is quite different from the other E stories that you find in um in the book of Genesis. So this story is it's kind of very interested in some kind of formula. It's interested in this um, six day period and then a seventh day Sabbath kind of thing. So, so there's something significant about that, um, which you will then see maybe when you go into the flood story again, where, where you see uh, so, some, some kind of an interest in the cleanliness of our uh, or sort of clean and unclean animals and sort of uh, and, and those sorts of things. So this theory was then picked up by Hermann Hapfield in 1853. And so what he said is actually there are two E sources and he called one of the sources E1 and he called the other source E2. Now, as I mentioned, the, the, one of the E sources is very interested in, in, in ritual things. So it's interested in things like the Sabbath, it's interested in sacrifices, it's interested in um, uh, ritual purity, uh, uh, it's, in, uh, yeah, it's interested in, in, in uh, genealogies and numbers. <laughs> so this source was later identified as uh, a P source, or in other words, it was a priestly source. It's the, it, it, it takes into account the interest of, of, of the priestly class. So, the, so E1 was then refer, was later referred to as the P source. So, so what you then have is, I need to correct that slide. Uh, what then you, you then have is that you, you now have four documents. So you have the J, the J source that uses Yahweh when it talks about God. You have the E source that uses Elohim when it talks about God, and then you have a separate source, Deuteronomy. And then you also have, uh, running through the Pentateuch, you have the P source, the priestly source, the source that is interested in things that have to do with the priestly class, ritual purity, uh, sacrifices, and so on. So that is kind of what is referred to now as the documentary hypothesis, where they say that uh, the book of Genesis uh, consists of it is a compilation of the writings from four different sources. And that, that's, that's kind of a theory that's um, still very much uh, accepted and respected in the field of biblical scholarship. So I think it will be helpful for us to just have a look at uh, some of the characteristics that are used to identify um, these four different sources. These are hypothetical sources, by the way. Now, what, what I will say is that this theory is quite a strong theory. And there was a period of time where um, there was kind of, people were starting to move away. Some scholars were starting to move away. Actually, not some, but a lot of scholars were trying to move away from this four source theory. Where, and what happened was the people started looking a lot deeper into the sources of the Pentateuch. And some people were saying, well, we, we, we have to look at the, the genre uh, of the sources. So there was something that's referred to as literary criticism, where you're looking at the genre, you're looking at when uh, this thing was likely to have been written. And, and it went really, really far so to the extent that they would look at, they would, they would take a manuscript and they would just break it down sort of word by word and try to see which source do we assign this to. Some, some, I, think, I think I've read somewhere that some people even went as far as breaking down the letters and go, well, which source do we assign this letter to and so on. And, and it just becomes uh, kind of a mind minefield. And so what some scholars have started to do in, in recent times is they've started to make a case for the simplicity of the uh, four source theory, where they're saying, well, let's just use Occam's razor. Let's just use the explanation that that's easiest to understand and, and, and makes the most sense. And that's what we're going to go with. And then they, they therefore insist on this four source theory. And I think one of the scholars whose works I've read is Joel Baden, who is a new, um, Hebrew Bible scholar at the University of Yale. He actually has a he, part of his course that he delivers at Yale is on YouTube 
go the introduction to the Hebrew Bible. I think I'll put a link in the description of this video. Uh, and he's written this book called uh, Renewing the D Documentary Hypothesis. And he basically makes a point that why, why are we overcomplicating things? Let's just stick to an explanation that makes the most sense, that's easiest to understand. And let's stick with this four source theory. Um, and he gives lots of very good examples in his book. It's a brilliant book. It's not the cheapest to buy, but uh, it, it is a good investment if you if you have an interest uh, in, in deepening your knowledge on this. Um, uh, and, and he gives really, really good examples. And he also explains how he arrives at saying who, which source do you assign this story or this part of the story to. Um, so that's basically the documentary hypothesis and where things stand today. So the characteristics of these four sources, very briefly. Um, so the P source uses Elohim for the divine name in most cases. It has a very formulaic style of writing. And I'm just, I'm just going to give an example from Genesis chapter 1. So in Genesis chapter 1, you have this formula. So you have um, God doing this, and then there was evening, and then there was morning, and then there was a, a first day, and then and then it breaks it up. So, so sort of the, you have these uh, sequences of three days, and then you have another sequence of three days, and then you have the seventh day, which is which is a rest day. And, and this is... And it does a lot of formulaic stuff uh, like that in its stories. Uh, P is also very interested in, in genealogies, and you can understand why priests would be interested in that because obviously they would want to prove that why they are part of the priestly class and why they should be part of that ruling class. Um, so there is a, a very deep interest in genealogies. Another thing I'll just say is if you think the story is quite heavy, and it's, it's got all these details and numbers and all sorts of things like that, then that's likely going to come from the priestly source. Uh, P is also very interested in covenants. It's interested in cultic practices and the priesthood. The J source. So the J source, as we said, it uses Yahweh, the tetragrammaton for the divine name. Uh, it's less formulaic than the, the priestly source. Uh, it is very much interested in ancestral promises of land and descendants, and it uses covenants to kind of establish these promises. And one other interesting thing that you will find in the J source is that uh, God is very un anthropomorphic in the in the J source. So uh, again, I'll just use a, an example from the two creation accounts. So in the account in Genesis chapter one, God takes this kind of standoffish approach to creation. So he just says, uh, let there be light, um, you know, let, let the land partition from the waters and so on. And he's just giving out these instructions and things are happening. In Genesis chapter two, in the creation account in Genesis chapter two, God takes on quite a, an interest in, he, in, in Adam and Eve. He actually forms Adam from the dust and he and takes the rib out of Adam. He forms Eve from the rib and so on. He has these conversations, uh, like one-to-one -one personal conversations in the garden with, uh, with, with Adam. Uh, so that is a characteristic of Jay that you see throughout the Pentateuch of God sort of coming down to the level of humans, sometimes even being seen by Moses, as you see, as we'll talk about later on. Um, so God being very anthropomorphic. Uh, how about then butcher that word completely? Uh, the Esos, um, so the Esos uses Elohim for the divine name. Uh, it's less formulaic in the style of writing than P. Uh, it emphasizes a prophetic interpretation of Israel's origin and uh, Abraham is idealized as a prophet. Uh, one of the accounts that I referred to earlier where uh, one of the rulers wanted to take Sarah as, uh, as their wife and Abraham lied effectively about uh, uh, Sarah being, saying Sarah was his sister instead of his wife. Uh, God reprimands this ruler and says, did you not know that this man was a prophet? So Abraham is very much being cast in the light of a prophet uh, in E. Um, now, the thing about J and E is that, uh, especially as you go on further, if you go on towards the end of Genesis, you get into Exodus, it becomes very difficult to distinguish between J and E. And sometimes you have to break up a sentence to say, this goes, this is assigned to J, this is assigned to E. So a lot of scholars, uh, at, so at, at some point, scholars just said, this is the J E source, and they just left it there. Uh, they didn't bother sort of breaking them apart. And some scholars still follow that convention where they just say J-E without bothering to, to sort of 
distinguish where J starts and ends, where E starts and ends, because it, it becomes very, very complicated and you can't apply or comes razor to that. Um, the D source. So the D source is confined to the literature in Deuteronomy. So basically, if you're talking about the D source, it's the, it's the, it's the D. But if you go on further, into um, the the books that are beyond Deuteronomy, there are some some of these are referred to as the Deuteronomistic history. In, in other words, the, the whoever was responsible for the D source then went and wrote uh, these other books beyond Deuteronomy because uh, of the similar interests in them. Um, and D consists of sermons and laws presented by Moses in a single day. Moses is effectively giving the speech. Um, that's what Deuteronomy is all about. And it focuses on the covenant, the need for Israel to be distinct from surrounding nations, uh, for the importance of centralized worship and the dangers of idolatry. Um, so in terms of the dating of the Pentateuch, so one might wonder why is it so important to kind of date the Pentateuch? And this is kind of important for biblical scholars because when you establish when approximately when this was written. You can kind of figure out what was happening when this was written and why this message was being sent out. Um, now, the earliest theories that were presented when the scholars were trying to date uh, the Pentateuch or the words that P was the earliest source. And one of the reasons they say that was the earliest story is in, in Genesis chapter one, the creation story in Genesis chapter one, which is from the P source. So it's kind of like a foundational history. And then other stories are then um, layered on top of these. Uh, but um, Julius Wilhelmsson, a German scholar, 19th century, uh, he lived in the 19th and the 20th century, he actually said the opposite. He said that P was the latest source. And the reason he said that is, I think when you assume that uh, P was the earliest source, you have this idea where there was centralized worship and then this worship got corrupted. And then in Deuteronomy, you have this polemic against this corruption of worship and then order is restored. Uh, but uh, Will Wilhelmsen said actually the opposite happened. Actually, initially there was this decentralized kind of worship and then, the, and then D came in and D tried to fight that. And that's why there's this strong polemic against this decentralized type of worship. And by the time P came in, all that, that order that D wanted had been restored. And so P just assumes that that's the way things have been all along. And so in P, there is really no conflict as such when, when they're writing. So um, well, according to Wellhausen, uh, J and D were sort of written around the beginning of the monarchy, the monarchic period in Israel. And then D, as we've mentioned, was written in the late monarchic period, but some, some say as late as the reign of Josiah or, or sometime just earlier than that. And then P was pretty much the latest source. And there is even a strong argument that this was probably written um, after the exile in Babylon when Israel was no longer a a kingdom with a king, but it was now a theocracy and the priests were essentially the ruling class and then they've, they've written that and superimposed it on the rest of the Pentateuch. And I think that's kind of um, a, a good a good theory. Um, so I've got some references in the slides there. As I said, I will upload, I'll put a link to these slides in the description so that you can uh, have a look uh, at them if you are interested in kind of looking at the material that I used to put these slides together. Uh, so the, the, the thing I will say is, I think it's a very important question uh, as to who actually wrote the Pentateuch. And uh, if you were going to ask me, I would say the, the Pentateuch was definitely not written by Moses. And as I've uh, discussed in this um, representation, uh, I think there is very, very good reasons to say that uh, Moses actually did not uh, write uh, the, the Pentateuch and and we and as we'll see later on as we explore uh, the book of Genesis uh, this becomes very very evident uh, but hopefully this overview has been helpful for anyone who wants to delve into the world of uh, 
Bible scholarship. Um, I do have a hope that at some point I will be able to bring on some Bible scholars uh, to discuss these subjects with me, or I will actually, hopefully I can even bring on people who are not actual Bible scholars, but they have an expert or very good knowledge of some of the topics that we're discussing um, around these themes. Um, it's a, my channel is a very small channel, so it's very complicated to bring uh, a Bible scholar, and especially one that's maybe reputable, uh, on, onto the on the, onto a small channel like this. But hopefully, the channel grows and gains more traction. That that will become uh, a possibility. Um, I also have an idea of if people have questions, um, maybe people can submit those questions and if they're relevant to the topic and depending on the length of the topic, the length of the, 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 the video, um, I will try and make it possible for some of those questions to be addressed as part of the, uh, of the project. So uh, I hope you found this interesting and informative. Um, if you haven't already done so, please don't forget to like or to subscribe to this video. And I will hope to see you again next time for another episode of uh, the Unholy Bible Project. Uh, that will be episode two. And in episode two, I will be talking about the two creation accounts in the book of Genesis. So I hope to see you all then. And until next time, it's goodbye from me. But you can't do that said one of the critics. That one doesn't bother me. Really? Again? Really? Look at that little enemy of God. Somehow we dilly and dally takes us years and we wonder why. What are you waiting for?